Thank you, Lord, you said whosoever. And God, you didn't put no limits on it. Anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere can pray to you and get saved. And thank you, Lord, you offer that to your children as well. Uh, you told us to boldly come before the throne of grace. Help us now. Uh, Lord, we have a short little uh, meeting before after church. And we have a, a, just a, a kind of administrative business thing to do. And God, we have to pray over our brother and sister as they hit the road. Uh, God, I pray you help them as they travel. And Lord, please bless the surgery. That it goes well and all the things. And I pray you just uh, help our sister. Uh, Lord, we love her a lot. And I, I don't know what we do without her. Uh, God, uh, she's, uh, she's kind of a backbone, uh, uh, part of the backbone of the church, Lord. And we need her. So, Lord, I pray you just uh, help them. Now, Lord, help us as we worship you. And God, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love to us, God. And speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> One day when heaven was filled with His praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men by His heavenly sin, letting me love me, dying in
until it no longer. One day the snow rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now it's ascended, my Lord evermore. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried, but sent for a way. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glory is there. One day the trumpet will stand for his coming. One day the stars with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one praying. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sin for a Turn to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Now, this is kind of a, I don't know, it's a, it's like Farmer Sunday or something, I don't know. Um, tonight I'm, I'm going to be preaching on reaping and sowing from Galatians. Uh, but I had this sermon, and, and the Lord seemed to indicate that he wanted me to preach this sermon. This sermon is about his seed. You know, if you're going to farm, you need seeds. And if we're going to do the Lord's work, it's likened to a farmer in a lot of places in the Bible. And you need his seed. If you're going to, if you're going to do his farm and his crops and have things to come out his way, you're going to have to put down his seed. Um, it says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. With my mouth I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever. And build up thy throne unto all generations. Salah. Heavenly Father, help us now to see the benefits of sowing your seed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, physically, Jesus is God's seed. He, he came down and he took a mortal uh, body and he was born in Bethlehem like any other baby. Uh, he grew up, he ate, you know, he ate food, he slept, he uh, walked around, he did everything that normal human beings do except one thing. He never sinned. That's how you could tell he was God's seed. And uh, he went back to heaven. Now his Holy Spirit is down here with us. Uh, but, you know, we are God's seed. We are. Uh, because... When we get saved, we're put in Him. So being in Him, since He was God's seed, we're God's seed. Uh, there's three verses in this psalm that talk about forever. One of them is verse number four. Notice it says, Thy seed will I establish forever. We're going to look at three of these forever things here. First of all, the seed is established. It's established. Now, you say, what has that got to do with seeds? Well, you'd be surprised. Seeds just don't, you know, pop out of the ground uh, by themselves. 
uh, they, they don't grow in the little packages you buy at the hardware store or, uh, you know, when it comes planting time at, at the Walmart, they have a big display of little seed packs. They don't come that way. Whatever plant they're for, that plant manufactured that seed. That's what the plant is for. That's its main job is to produce uh, seeds. You say, well, what about like tomatoes? Okay. When you open up a tomato, what do you got in the middle of the tomato? You got a bunch of little seeds and all that goo down in that tomato we goo. And the deal is, is when that uh, plant was in the wild, uh, it grew up on something like, like the steak you put in your garden. But maybe it was another bush or a tree or something. And then that piece of uh, fruit, that tomato would fall on the ground and it would kind of eventually get kind of... Uh, uh, dug into the ground, melted whatever into the ground, and all that stuff became food for the seed. And then some more little tomato plants would grow. That's all a plant does, is it just reproduces more plants to make more seeds, to make more plants, to make more seeds. And that's what it's, I mean by the seed was established. Some little plant had to make that seed. Some spiritual something had to make you as a Christian. Um... 1 Corinthians uh, 2, verse 2, says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now I want you to notice Paul determined something when he went to preach to people. He did not preach about politics. He did not preach about the weather. He did not preach about uh, even prophecy per se, unless it had to do with one thing. Jesus Christ. That's what we preach here. We preach our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the only one that can do people any good. You can bow down in front of me all you want, and I can't save you one iota. If I tried to save you, you'd go to hell like a bullet. Amen. I can't do anything but tell you about my wonderful Savior. We just sang about all that, and that song, that song is what, five, six verses long? And it, it takes you through the whole story of Jesus, what he did. Yeah. His birth, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and his coming back again. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a, I like that song. Some people find it a little boring because it's long. But that's all right. It, it tells you how things came to be. God determined to send Jesus to the earth to save people. I mean, before that, you had to take little animals up to the temple and, you know, sacrifice them. You say, well, isn't some of that stuff going to come back in the millennium? Yeah, but there's a difference. In the Old Testament, when you took that little lamb or bull or whatever you took up to the temple to have sacrificed, you were sacrificing for yourself or someone in your family. You were doing it in their stead. In the millennium, all those sacrifices are national sacrifices. For the whole group of people, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. When we, our country was established, we, uh, we were established as a free country. Everybody was supposed to be free. You say, well, everybody wasn't free. Well, that caused problems, didn't it? Uh, and, you know, I guess in some ways it continues to through the years. But it's determined, Paul was determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ amongst people. Secondly, I want you to notice that the seed that we're talking about was built up. Was built up. Um, 1 Corinthians 2 Verses 3 through 5. So moving on to the next verse in 1 Corinthians 2. It said, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You do happen to look at a seed. Now maybe, maybe some of you are making jack-o'-lanterns or carving out a pumpkin to make pumpkin pie with or something. 
You open up that pumpkin, what's in there? Well, there's a lot of that same goop, sort of like the, not quite like a tomato, but there's goop in there, and there's little seeds, little flat pumpkin seeds. Um, when I was a kid, I was real curious, so I found the biggest seed I could find, a uh, pumpkin one time, and, and I went to the kitchen, and I sliced it in half. Uh, first of all, I sliced it down, uh, you know, so it was too thin. And I couldn't see nothing. It was too thin. So um, I went to my mom and said, I want to see what's in this seed. I want to slice it. And I showed her what I'd done. She said, that's awful hard. I, she said, but I got a knife that would do it. And she picked out a certain knife. And she got one of these things that... Um, you open jar lids with. It was some kind of contraption. And she put the little seed in there and proceeded to slice it down so it opened like a little buck. And you could see what was in the seed. And you could see it was a very intricate little thing. Now God in his wisdom, when he makes something, whether it's a human or whether it's a Christian, it's an intricate thing that he makes. It's, it's built up. You just don't get saved and the next day you go out and evangelize the world. You got to learn some stuff. You got to learn how to pray. You got to learn what the Bible says. You got to learn how to, you know, how to read the Bible. The Bible's not your everyday book. People criticize our Bible because it's not an everyday book. Well, the Bible's not supposed to be an everyday book. It's a special book. And you read it and it will build you up. And that way, if if you if you get built up by God, not only do you give God credit, but that's how you have faith in. And then when something goes wrong in your life, guess who you go to? You don't come running to the preacher. You go running to God. You say, God, something's messed up. I don't know what to do. Help me fix it. Or fix it, Lord, for me. So it's built up. And you know, this, this seed... The best thing about God is he offers his gifts to all. Anybody can be a Christian that wants to be a Christian. Now they have to come God's way. But look. You can't take a seed and stick it down in some wet concrete and expect anything. It ain't going to grow. Why? Because the concrete gets real hard and there ain't all the nutrients in a hunk of concrete for a seed. But you go out and find you some of that black loamy soil and, and, and something that's, you know, can kind of got, got some of the right consistency in it. And, and you go out and you put some seeds in that. You know what's going to happen? The stuff is going to grow in that because it's the right thing. Acts 17 verse 24 says, God that made the world... And all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. Paul's being kind of smart, Alec. God don't need nothing. What are you going to give to God? He don't need what you got. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. There ain't a thing you have that God didn't give you. And he made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and have to term of the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So God made everybody, uh, doesn't matter what color your skin is, inside we're basically all the same. And God, but God did say, okay, you live over here and you live over here and you live over here. The trouble is with the world is it's gotten where everybody's everywhere. And it does cause problems. New York City, the mayor of New York City has got up and basically told the Texans, quit sending the Mexicans up to our city. We can't handle no more of them. Well, you know, so I, I, I'm as charitable as I be, but the Mexicans belong in Mexico. They don't belong here. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. I want you to notice that it says in the Bible that God's not far from everybody, even lost people. All they have to do is reach out and God's there for them if they want him. 
A young pianist was giving concerts in the provinces of Germany. Uh, to add to her own renown, she announced herself as a pupil of the celebrated composer Liszt. Arriving in a small provincial town, she advertised the concert in the usual way. But what was her astonishment and terror to see in the list of new arrivals at the hotel when she went to register the name of M. Period I.A.B. Liszt. <laughs> Whoops. He was in the same hotel. Hotel she was. Her deception would be discovered. What she was she going to do? She could never dare to give another concert. She was afraid. In her desperation, she adopted the wisest course. She went directly to the man himself. Pale and trembling and deeply agitated, she entered into the presence of the great maestro to confess her fraud and to implore forgiveness. She threw herself at his feet. Her face was bathed in tears and related to him the history of her life. Left an orphan when she was very young. I don't know. It sounds like she's making some of this stuff up, doesn't it? She was an orphan when very young, possessing nothing but her musical gifts. She had ventured to shelter herself under the protection of his great name. Well, that's laying it on thick. And thus to overcome many obstacles which opposed her. Without that, she would have been nothing and nobody. But could he ever forgive her? Come, come, said the man himself. We shall see what we can do. Here's a piano. Let me hear a piece intended for the concert tomorrow. She obeyed. She played at first timidly. And then with the enthusiasm of reviving hope, the maestro stood near her and gave her some advice and suggested some improvements. And when she had finished her piece, said most kindly, Now, my child, I have given you a music lesson. You are now my pupil. <laughs> you can go tell everybody you're a student of Liszt. Before she could recover sufficiently to utter a word of acknowledgement, he added, Are the programs printed? Not yet, sir. Then add to them that your program will be assisted by your master and that the last piece will be played by A.B. List. Could any reproof be keener than such a forgiving kindness, such noble generosity as this? The illustrious musician would no doubt have been questioned and it would have been impossible for him to speak anything but the truth. But charity is ingenious covering a multitude of sins. I like that story. Who knows if it really happened, but it's a good story. Well, the seed is established. Not only that, but the Bible says God's seed endures forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Verse 29 in that same Psalm. Psalm 89, verse 29. It says, His seed also will I make endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. That's a pretty good promise. God makes all kinds of promises in the Bible. He says, the promise he, that I will make. Look, when God is determined to do something in your life, he will cause it to come to fruition. God has the power to keep his promises. No matter what the promises are. I've been reading in Ezekiel from my Bible reading this week, and I ran across the chapter, The Valley of Dry Bones. And you, you said, oh, that really didn't happen, did it? Yeah, it did. The Bible says the bones were laying there, and all of a sudden the bones came together in the right order, hooked to the right bone. And then, then the muscles and the tendons and all the nerves that came on the bone, then the skin came on the bone, then the breath, the wind blew and the breath came in them, and there was a whole army standing there. God can, God can do anything you need for him to do. He can keep your promises. Yeah. Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light, God said, and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, 
do all these things. I guess you can trust him, can't you? Ah, uh, it's a possession, this seed is claimed. Notice he says it's his seed. His seed will I make. He, he went from thy seed to his. He took possession of you. You're his. You're no longer your own. See, that's the trouble with some Christians. They want to think they're still their own person. You're not your own person. You're God's person. If you want things to go right, you need to acknowledge that. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth. Without iniquity, just and right is he. Deuteronomy 32, 4. His work is perfect. He is... He is the rock, and he's your rock, and you're his. Uh, notice that in this verse it's compared with the days in heaven. Uh, look at Deuteronomy uh, 32, 39. In that same chapter, if you want to go there. And uh, keep your finger there in uh, Psalm 89, because we're going to look at verse 29. No, we are looking at verse 30. Yeah, 29 again. His seed also will I make endure forever, and his stone is the days of heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39 through 43. Uh, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Well, that's some verse. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour, devour flesh. And that was blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of the revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice ye nations. With his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his enemies and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. It's talking about the beginning of the millennium and the end of the millennium when we have that big battle and everything just kind of blows up. Look, God wins in the end, basically. We win. We win. So, the seed, you. Endures forever. 100 Puritans, remember, crossed the Atlantic Ocean on the Mayflower and found a home in New England where they could serve God according to the dictates of their conscience. Persecution in England had been getting, uh, being continued. Uh, the men crossed the Atlantic to join the Pilgrim Fathers. So once they landed, more people came over from England because they kept persecuting them. Uh, in a land where religion and liberty uh, found a sure home. In 10 years, 20,000 persecuted Englishmen found a refuge on the shores of Massachusetts and the colonies of America. That's a lot of people. A Protestant colony is founded by sturdy, resolute men. Not only were they religious men, but they were the noblest class of immigrants who ever left the shore of any land to that new land. God's church prosper. Today, Protestant America is a result of men flying from one land to another for liberty to serve God. He guided the Mayflower across the sea and watched over the infant colony founded his church on a free American soil. Now we have Baptist churches, Methodist churches, we got we got Anglican churches, we got all kinds of churches. And there's saved people in all of them. There's lost people in some of them. But you'd be surprised how many saved people are in them churches that you probably wouldn't go to. I don't blame you, I probably wouldn't either. Verse 36 in Psalm 89. His seed shall endure forever. Well, it talks about forever. And his throne is as the sun before me. 
The seed is enthroned in God's scheme of things. The seed. It's enthroned. Of course, I mean the Lord Jesus Christ. And those of us that are in Christ, the seed, the seed belongs to Christ Himself. The seed that we plant. The Word of God. The seed that's in us. The Holy Spirit. Uh, we're in Him. He's in us. And we must let Him work through us every day. We must sit Him on the throne. And we need to put His Word there. We're down the list somewhere. 1 Corinthians 3.23 And ye are Christ and Christ is God's. You see there we're His. Revelation 15.23 But every man in his own order Christ the first fruits. Afterward they that are Christ that is coming. One day the trumpet's going to sound. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Because that seed goes back to the owner of the seed. Amen. And we're going to be around the sovereign throne of God. Now a lot of people, every time I use sovereign in the sermon, Brother Bill said, no, you aren't going Calvinist on me. I said, no, I simply mean that God rules over Sitting on the throne. That's all I mean. That's all the Bible means when it uses any kind of term like that. And look, I'm going to read you in Revelation 21. Revelation 21 hasn't happened yet. And he that sat upon the throne. See, he's a sovereign. He's on the throne. Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life free. But he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead and in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So all them tribulation saints are going to be joining us in heaven. Hallelujah. We get to reign for a thousand years with him. That seed got planted, and finally it comes up in the future. It ain't here yet. And it's going to be the most wonderful thousand years that this old earth had. And then this old earth is going to pass away. A gentleman tells of an interesting visit to the observatory of Harvard University. Uh, just after a new astro uh, astronomical instrument had been purchased. According to the astronomer, uh, the calculations uh, contained... In a little book, 10 years old, which calculations were based on the observation of a thousand year old, a star was due to appear at 5.20 p.m. So he came there with his new telescope. And everybody was waiting for this star to appear. They had figured it all out through the years, and that's when it was going to appear. And when the hour drew near, the instrument was at once directed to the star where it was going to be. And prone on his back with the eyepiece on his eye, the enthusiastic professor lay waiting for the star to appear. It was agreed that when the star, which came moving along in the heavens, crossed the spiderweb line, stretched across the lens of the instrument, the professor who was watching would pronounce the word, Here! In other words, it's here. It was also agreed that an assistant who watched the second hand of the clock should let a hammer fall on a marble table the instant the clock said it was 520. The professor was watching the star and could not see the clock. Just as the clock indicated at 520, the professor said, Here, the assistant tapped the table. That's how exact God's movement is in the heavens. When I say God's in charge, he's in charge, folks. Amen. That's an amazing thing that they can figure out that a star is going to be click. 
So what's that star type of? Well, it's a type of Christ. The sun up in the sky is a type of Christ. Psalm 19, verse 4. Their line has gone out through all the earth. Their word is at the ends of the world. To them hath he a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom. That's Jesus. Coming out of his chamber and rejoices that as a strong man to run a race. For he goeth forth from the end of the heaven and his circuit to the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Look, Jesus is coming back. He's going to gather his saints up. He's going to judge them before his judgment seat. Then right before he comes back to get uh, everything straightened out in the millennium, uh, he's going to gather some of those tribulation people up. And then we're going to come on those white horses and defeat the Antichrist and set up the millennial kingdom. And boy, oh boy, that's going to be a day. I can't wait. I can't. Eat. Horses don't even like me. First thing the Lord's going to have to do is find a horse that likes me. So this seed is very important to us. Psalm 37 in conclusion. I like this little verse. It says, I have been young. Now I am old. Yet, I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. You want a blessing today? Go find someone and tell them the story. Get them to become a seed. Let them be in Christ. Uh, you'll be happy. You say, well, I, you know, I... I Look, take some time. Sow the seed. Tell them about the seed that's already been here. Tell them about you and how you became a Christian. You'd be surprised. People will listen to a personal story. You say, well, my testimony's not very good. Yeah, I know. I got saved in my bedroom. That's not very thrilling. <laughs> but you know what? It was thrilling to me. I changed. There was something happened at that bedside. I became a different person. I became his seed. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we're yours and you're, and you're my, ours. And Lord, one day you're coming back. God, I, all that stuff is thrilling to me. It's going to happen. God, the best part of it is God, we get a glorified body and and we don't have to worry about growing old or all the aches and pains or getting sick or and all this and all the stuff that happens on the world. We won't have to worry about it no more, God. But while we're here, before you get here, please help us to be busy. Help us to have uh, pockets full of seeds. And Lord, a testimony on our lips that tells about the word and help us to sow and sow and sow and sow and sow and God I know the birds come and the weeds come and, and all the bad things can happen to a little seed but God some of it does come up and it brings fruit and that's a blessing to you and it's a blessing to us so Lord as we go into the harvest season we don't have any farmers here, but I, probably someone's growing a tomato plant or had a little garden at some time. Help us to remember the miracle of nature and what you do. Please come back and get us soon, Lord. And give us some souls while we're here. God, so we can go to heaven and bear our sheaves with us, Lord. Thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Don't.